United Against Cancer. So a very good morning, afternoon, evening to all our viewers today. My name is Zainab Shinkafi Bagudu. I'm a child health specialist with a special interest in cancer as it affects women in low middle income countries, as well as the disparities that exist and how we can close those care gaps. Our series United Against Cancer is taking us through work, the work that various professionals across the world are doing, the very good work, I might add, in the area of cancer control, as it affects adults, children, and males, females, everybody. Cancer does not know any boundaries. It doesn't discriminate against sex or any other social determinants. Today, I'm going to be having a very nice chat with somebody from my own world, I might add. His name is Mr. Luke Thomas, and he's the CEO of World Child Cancer, which is one of the foremost childhood organizations, as the name suggests, that is focused on childhood cancer. A lot of people ask me, do children get cancer? Oh, yes, they do. And today we're going to be speaking about it. So not to take the wind out of his sail, I'm going to ask Luke to tell us a little bit out of uh, his very vast uh, experience, give us some background about your work and your experience, the positions that you occupy, and uh, before we delve into the main conversation. Thank you for joining us, Luke. Fantastic. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, it's lovely to to talk to people, like you say, in our in our world. I think there's one of the things that, that I love about what I do at World Child Cancer and what we do as, as an organization is the chance to collaborate with experts, organizations around the world. And I think that, you know, to actually get where we want to be by 2030, you know, with the global initiative, et cetera, those partnerships, those relationships are going to be are going to be absolutely vital. So, yeah, it's a real pleasure to to talk to you today. Um, I've had the fortune uh, to to travel a lot in sub-Saharan Africa, um, you know, including including Nigeria, and um, and I've you know been lucky enough to work in international health for for many many years. And I think that for me, it's one of the, the there are probably two things that I think that the world can do, and every country can do to improve you know, our lives as, as a as a planet, and that is improve education and improve health. And I think if we can do those two things, we lift all of ourselves up. And so it's, it's just great to be to be part of it. And I've been doing this for, for 20 years, although this is now my first my first role in in the world of, of childhood cancer. So I'm still learning a lot in in this area. Yes, that's good to know. And then also, you know, it doesn't matter if you have been spent it in childhood cancer in other leading organizations for 20 years, you build the experience and the leadership yeah. skills that you will bring on board. So what exactly does the World Child Cancer Organization do? Yeah, so we um so we've been around since 2007 and really the, the sort of the key thing for us is about a holistic approach to childhood cancer because you know we have we have sort of four pillars to our work really which is sort of improving early diagnosis and we'll talk more about this in, in just a bit uh, improving the access to treatment because those various barriers to accessing treatment are are enormous in in some countries uh, there's what we call psychosocial support which is really all of the elements around those other two areas you know so it's it's ensuring that parents and children and healthcare professionals have the care and support they need and the financial resources they need to actually access see through treatment stay in treatment and actually have good outcomes in the in the long term and then the, mm -hmm. the fourth pillar of our work is around advocacy because obviously we can support you know hospitals governments partners that we work with to to deliver and provide those high quality services but ultimately you know it it's our job is to is to pass on the baton to you know so that governments and and healthcare ministries healthcare systems can actually ultimately support and partner with us and, and pick up the baton when they're when they're able to 
Excellent. So one thing that struck me in your bio is the fact that you have this vast international experience in the nonprofit sector. And with that uh, comes also closely related to that is the word philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And on the back of that is fundraising. And you have a strong background as a, in fundraising and strategy. And the area of philanthropy is constantly evolving. Um, whatever parts of the world you are, high, low, middle income, and what do you see as the biggest opportunities and at the same time, the challenges that you have as a child cancer organization in securing the funds that is needed to make this difference that we so desire? Yeah, so I think there's there's a couple of things. I think on the on the challenge, I'll start with the challenges because I always like to finish on a positive. Um, okay. on, the, on the challenges, I think that, you know, there's a lot of economic uncertainty in the world right now. I think there are very few countries in the world who haven't been touched by that since probably since 2020 at the very least. But actually going back to the 2008 financial crash, you know, many countries have never fully recovered from that. And wealth has not been evenly distributed. And as people, have, as the economies have started returning to health, the, the wealth has not been evenly distributed. And I think that for people to give at whatever level, whether it's a regular donation of five pounds or whether it's you know a, a major donor, people need to feel like they can afford that. They can need to feel that they have spare money. I think so. That economic uncertainty around the world um, and all the kind of stuff that's that's been going on is a challenge to, to, because to when you have as a as a fundraiser, you want people to feel confident. You want people to feel wealthy to you know as, as much as they can and you also want them to feel that your issue the thing that we're trying to raise money for is one of the top priorities for them because you know when you have global wars or natural disasters you know those things are they're urgent and they're present and they and they attract and they're naturally and correctly they attract a lot of a lot of attention so so we're, we're competing against a lot of a lot of different sort of challenges at the moment on the on the financial front that said on the more on the more positive front positive. so what i like to say it's always nice to, to finish on a positive mm -hmm. i think there mm -hmm. i think the thing that really works in our favor is that firstly childhood cancer is curable it is so very curable in comparison to other forms of cancer even you know to adult cancers or to or to chronic disease or lots of other things that are actually you know really really challenging to say this is a curable disease and we're talking about children and I think that those two things that and it's up to us really to demonstrate that we can that we're part of that. You know, we're actually making that happen and that every day you and I are out there saving lives and that donors by the very act of giving are saving lives. And I think that part of what we do in fundraising is to remove world child cancer from the discussion, because really we're a bridge between the donors who want to help and the outcomes for children. So we, you know, one of the things that we're really working on a lot at the moment is, is building up a range of strategic partnerships because the challenges are complex um, and we want to have partnerships that really address the complexity of that. They don't just want to solve, have the one little piece where they can wave their flag and say, we did that, but they actually yes. recognize that there's this, there's an opportunity to make a really big difference over the next, you know, five, 10 years and that they can be part of it in a, in a really significant way. And I think there's, that we're pleased to say that, you know, we're starting to see real interest in that. Um, and we hope that will, that will continue. Hmm. Very interesting approach. So taking away, um, in a way, your own organization or the name of it and focusing on the course. And I think that is a big lesson for us to take away today. Make sure the course is strong enough so that it can appeal to the required donors, recognizing the, should I say, issues that are around that course. In this particular case, we're looking at a very wide disparity, uh, especially in low income countries and the level of um, survivorship, should I say, that yes. we see in child cancer. But the mere fact that if they are able to survive, it is curable. That is a light at the end of the tunnel that most it's people such a positive message. To. Yeah, it's yes. such a positive message to take to people. And I think mm -hmm. when we when I talk about taking ourselves out of the equation, I think that one of the things the thing I always talk to my fundraising and, and communications team about is that ultimately people don't care about world child cancer, they care about the children. 
So if we can yes. make that donor feel like the impact is as and it is as a result of their support, what mm. an amazing way to connect someone to the cause. And you know, do, you know, I always say, you know, no money, no mission. So donors are just as important to our cause as the as the nurses, as the program managers, as all the kind of different people who play a role in it. It's really important to make them feel that that is an important part of their connection. Yes, yes, that's very interesting. We do a very big walk every October. Uh, we focus on all the cancers at the Medicaid Cancer Foundation because of the great need that there mm. is in terms of that. Yeah. So the walk is really, it's a breast cancer month, but it's dedicated to all the common cancers. So every year, of course, we do the walk paraphernalia and people are encouraged to buy it as a sort of, as a fundraiser, clearly, so that we can mm -hmm. support cancer patients. And last year we had a t-shirt that said this shirt saves lives. We've never sold as many kits as that. Brilliant. It wasn't about our logo and the colors or anything. It was about the message. And that message really got to people, even in a... <laughs> Just so you know, I'm making a notice that I'm absolutely going to be stealing this. <laughs> I'll, I'll pay you the yeah. copyright fees. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. The, the rest... I didn't expect it and the response was so good and it, so that that is really something that we've proven and uh, relates to so if we can go a little bit more into resource constrained environments and um, you mentioned that you work in different parts of the world and how we how do you think that of course the level of operation and access to various resources, not just funding, skilled personnel, skilled um, fundraisers, the computers, the data sets that you can use to access these people um, differs between in high and resource constrained settings. And in the course of your work in resource constrained settings, how do you think um, organizations like, should I say yours and ours can work better together to help in bridging the ultimate gap, uh, which is the, you know, the disparities that we see in childhood cancers, for instance. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I wish there was a simple answer to this, uh, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I think that mm -hmm. it is one of the big differences um, in terms of survive. You know, the sort of improved survival rates is the ability to use data, both in terms of not just in terms of the kind of the, the work that happens in a hospital, but at what point are children getting to hospital? Are they at stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four? Because obviously that has a big impact on survival rates once you're actually in hospital. Um, and registries and you know, better collection and use of data to actually measure the right things will really help us, our partner hospitals, and all the you know, all the countries that we that we work with to actually make sure that we're tailoring the services to the needs of you know, to the unique needs of, of every population. Um, so that's something I w over the course of the next kind of, you know, five to 10 years, that's something I would dearly love to see um, because I, I genuinely think there's, there's two factors which ultimately will determine whether we're going to be successful. And that's the good use of data and that's the best use of expertise. You know, making sure we're training experts and giving them the right equipment to do their jobs and then measuring that work effectively so we know what works, what doesn't, and how to keep improving every every single day. And I think that's that's definitely something that we 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 would dearly love to to see more. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.